So hi, welcome. Uh, I'm Zach Parrish. Uh, I've, I've met a good chunk of you. I've been to many of your studios uh, here in Montreal. So uh, if, for those of you who don't know, though, I'm a tech artist attached to developer relations and support. And I spend most of my time working with other studios, trying to help them make shippable content for their games, uh, give them guidance on what they could be doing better, or show them new features, etc. And usually when I, do, when I do these talks in front of a group of people, it's usually it's, it's this exciting thing where like, I'm going to walk around, flail my arms, be very animated, and show you some new feature or some technique or something you should be doing. This year my talk is a little anomalous because I'm going to do something totally different. I mean, there'll still be plenty of animation and bad jokes and me flailing around making a fool of myself, but I'm going to talk about the things that you should not be doing uh, when, you're, when you're making your games. Uh, this talk went through a lot of iterations. It was... Uh, at one point, it was going to be called The Seven Deadly Sins of Unreal Development, but that sounded a little too dramatic. So in essence, what we're going to do is cover seven topics that we keep running into over and over again as we talk to Unreal developers in the field, uh, things that people struggle with that make shipping harder on them. And as I mention each one, as I go through them, most of you will look at me and go like, well, obviously, Zach. We would never do that at our studio. And, I, and you're probably right, but these are constant themes that we see over and over again. And most of you in the audience, I have been to your studios, and I'm pretty sure none of you are completely free of what we're going to talk about today. So uh, just kind of a brief overview. We're going to talk about doing too much in your game and what that means, particularly from a content side. As many of you probably already know, I'm not an engineer, so I'm not going to be telling you about coding best practices. We'll talk about content developer accountability and how to keep the people who are making your game making good decisions so that you don't have to go back and clean up a great deal of, uh, of mess as you, uh, as you get closer to ship. I'm going to hammer on Blueprint quite a bit uh, because it's, it's awesome and it opens the door for uh, visual people to make coding decisions. We can discuss the merits of that later. Uh, we'll talk about platforms uh, and how to work with them, some best practices on keeping platforms in mind. We'll talk about the granularity of your game and keeping things broke up. That's kind of a, a thin point, but it's worth knowing that, uh, that it is something that everybody kind of runs into at some point. Fighting the tech, which is a, kind of an involved discussion. We'll get there. I'll tell you what that means when, when the time's right. And then finally, we'll mention the epic support structure and how we really wish people would use it more, and, more than they do. So I've already kind of covered this stuff on this slide, but in short, the reason I'm doing this is because we do run into a lot of studios who right before they ship, they hit us up, their building's on fire, something's not going right, oh my god, we're having, like, we, we can't reach uh, frame rate on platform X, and we desperately need your help, and it usually boils down to some flavor of what we're going to talk about today. I don't expect anything that I tell you today to change the way you develop. Uh, maybe it will, but ideally just knowing that these things are problems can help you make a few better decisions so that things aren't quite so scary and stressful as you approach ship. So common pitfall number one, doing too much. And that means a lot of things to a lot of different pieces of content. But the, the underlying theme here is that Unreal is amazing, it's super powerful, and it makes really pretty scenes. Uh, we've put a lot of work into it to make it that way, and that power ends up seducing a lot of developers, uh, particularly on the art side, uh, because they see us release tech demos and, and our games, like Paragon was gorgeous, and it ran at 60 hertz on a PS4, and that was a, a technical marvel in and of itself. But artists ha also have this tendency of like, cool, well, my scene needs to look even better than that. And it's very easy to go overboard. And the most common things that cause, these, cause problems here are adding too many level actors, not being smart with character development, and of course, blueprints, which can hammer your CPU. And we'll, co we'll cover blueprints in depth as we move through the discussion. So let's start with level actors just the things that you populate your worlds with. So this is probably the earliest, mis or the easiest early mistake that uh, we come across. Uh, even, even here in Montreal, several studios that I've talked to have run into this problem. So it's, as I mentioned earlier, sorry, the echo in here is totally tripping me out. Like I feel like I should be announcing baseball or something. And also real quick as a side note, does this not look like a Gears of War level right before Emergence Day? 
Like, I'm just waiting for, like, this guy to turn orange and, like, an emergence pit to open up over here. Anyway, sorry. So, it's very easy for artists to do what they do and make your world look beautiful and very easy for them to add a ton of static meshes and a ton of particles and lights and things because your rich worlds do look good, but uh, the problem there is that you can get to a point where your actor counts are too high, you have too many meshes on the screen, your draw thread gets too heavy. And uh, again, all of this sounds obvious and it sounds like, oh, well, of course you wouldn't want to do that, but we run into it over and over and over again. And why does that keep happening? And it's because production's hard. Like making games is chaotic and crazy. and Folks will make a prototype level and they'll think, ah, it's fine, you know, we're just trying to figure out what our level looks like. It's totally cool that we have 86,000 trees in this forest. That's good. Uh, but then time comes to go into full production and now somebody's got to clean up that mess. Also, uh, we see a lot of cases where scope and platform changes happen. Uh, there is a, uh, there's one developer I talked to somewhat recently that had a Diablo-esque game, you know, like the isometric camera and and they built their levels to that idea, right? Like you've got a, a, a known frustum, you can really populate your levels in that. But they had a scope change and suddenly they had to look out at great big vistas and that content suddenly doesn't work quite as well. So know that those types of things happen and try to be smart as much as you can. Uh, also, there are sometimes misconceptions on what Unreal does and how it does it. There are, there are actually several folks I've talked to who always thought that if you put multiple copies of a static mesh into your world, they automatically just get instantiated. And that's not the case at all. They're all individual draw calls, or at least for now. There does exist a future uh, based on the rendering overhaul that we're doing that should land uh, later this year to early next year. That will actually pave the way sometime in the future for us to do something like automatic instancing, but right now it's not a thing. So artists are responsible for staying on top of their object counts. Also, there is a, a notable lack of knowledge of what tools we've already put in the engine to make these types of decisions easier, to help people reduce objects in your scene while still keeping fidelity high. We'll cover a couple of them here, uh, just so that you know what they are. And a super common one is that there is no owner for that budget and that vision. Folks get together in their art to, their art meetings or whatnot, they're like, yeah, we should keep our draw calls to some number, but there's no, no sheriff, no police officer who's like, yeah, no, no, we're, we're overblowing our budget. So the next question is always, how many objects is too many? At what point have we gone overboard? Uh, you'll know because you'll throw it on an Xbox and it'll melt it, but, uh, so I always get that question though. How many should we try to maintain and the answer is there is no answer, really. It's all really dependent on your content and what you're doing and what your game looks like and what your game plays like. That said, uh, I pestered a bunch of the, the folks at Epic, and generally, we try to keep our actor counts around the two to 3,000 mark after culling. So like during gameplay, they stay around two to 3,000. If you can keep it around that, that's probably your ideal. Again, though, it's, it's content dependent. Uh, during level design, uh, when culling hasn't happened yet, it could be around double that. Again though, just please, this is just a guideline. This is what's working for us. It may not work for the game that you're building, but it feels good to have some kind of a baseline to work from. As always though, test on your lowest common denominator platform. Now a point that I brought up earlier is knowing what tools are available to make your life easier. So understand proper reduction techniques, know about uh, hierarchical, uh, 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 level of detail, HLODs, make sure you're using those. Know about the proxy LOD tool, which just got an overhaul recently, I think as of 420 or 421, they all blur together for me, unfortunately. So HLOD is just going to take clusters of meshes and combine them together. Proxy LOD will take that single mesh and start to reduce it down as a single thing. Use these tools, know what they are. Know about hierarchical instant static meshes. This one's critical and it's real easy to overlook because it actually takes a little bit of work. So as you're laying out your forests or your room full of chairs or something, it's very easy just to place those in your world. But with a little bit of blueprint work, you can make those into uh, HISMs that will automatically occlude. They'll automatically be treated as a single draw call. It's very handy. And if you need to do it after the fact, which happens all the time, by the way, you can write a, uh, a I hate the word, a utility blueprint or a blue utility that allows, isn't that great? 
So uh, you can write a blue utility that will help you do this after the fact. Another one you can use is actor merging. We've actually used this a lot on, on uh, our projects, particularly things that we know are going out for VR. We use it a lot for Robo Recall. All this does is take a collection of meshes that are already in your scene, it combines them into a single mesh and then stores that off as a new asset in your content browser and replaces what was in your world. It's convenient for what it, uh, for what it does, but it is adding more assets to your game, making your games install bigger, know the pros and cons, know the trade-offs there. Okay, so the next point for doing too much is characters. Characters can really bring a game down to its knees and for a lot of really good reasons, right? Characters get easily expensive. They have a set cost anyway, the character movement component has a cost, your bones, your vertices, your animation, it all adds up on the CPU. They're often made of a whole bunch of parts. Customizability is getting more common in games. A lot of high-end complex materials to hammer on your GPU. You have a lot of bones and vertices to worry about. And of course, there's your animation blueprint, and you can really make some bad decisions in your animation blueprint. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk to you later today about good things you can do in your animations. So a common one that we actually ran into ourselves is keeping track of the number of characters on your screen. As you end up making your characters more complex, you have to be more cognizant of this. So these will add up very quickly. If you need more detail on how to manage this, if you are making a game where you just need a lot of characters all at once, please make sure that you check out the optimizing UE4 for Fortnite talk we did at GDC this past year. There's, a, there's solid gold in there on how we managed to pull this off for Fortnite. Keep on top of character bone counts. So we try to keep ours in the mid to low 200s for our characters. Uh, but that's just at laud zero. We aggressively laud our characters down uh, as you back away from them, as they have smaller screen space. Uh, coming in four, sorry, distracting. So uh, coming in 422 is a uh, skeletal mesh reduction, which uh, Julie talked about briefly. So that'll be a completely in-editor tool for creating LODs for your characters. Uh, no simply gone whatsoever. So probably would have made it into 421, but it just barely missed the, the window for that. So of course, it's important to test early and often with your character counts. Get as many of your characters onto the screen as one. Uh, make sure that you're, you're testing how your gameplay is gonna be and do it on a target device. I'm gonna hammer on this one a lot, uh, especially here in just a couple of minutes. We do get, uh, we get licensees all the time who, right before ship, suddenly say like, oh, we can't hit frame rate on this platform. And it's because they haven't been testing on that platform up to that point. So don't be, don't be that guy. Uh, again, make sure you watch the uh, UE4 for Fortnite presentation. It talks about things like the Significance Manager. If you're unfamiliar, really all the Significance Manager does, if you really had to boil it down, is it provides you with an ordered list it's kind of it. You can feed it the criteria you want uh, to create that list. So it could be based on distance, whether you're looking at somebody, whether you're aiming at them down a rifle scope. Make sure that you know how that works and how you can use the results of that list to change LODs, to slow down tick time, to stop calculating things. So be aware of these types of tools and how you can implement them in your game. Know that if your character blueprint gets too complex, you may need to migrate their event graph over to C++. So that's something that we ended up doing in Paragon. We've done it uh, here and there in Fortnite as well. Uh, that first part of your animation blueprint does get uh, kind of heavy over time. So if you need that CPU back, uh, that's definitely an option. So next common pitfall that uh, we run into is avoiding performance accountability. This one's more common than you would think. A lot of studios who are new to UE4, uh, they ask us what their budget should be, and the answer is always kind of like, it depends. We can give you the budgets for things like um, Paragon or uh, Fortnite if you need them, but if we're not making the same kind of game you are, it's not always super helpful. But while budgets are really nice to have, you're still responsible for maintaining your performance, so make sure you're monitoring even beyond your budget. Just uh, matching your budget doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna hit performance. And the big point here that, that I've run into many times and causes a lot of pain and stress is to avoid the janitor model. And maybe some of you are the janitors here, but this is where you have 
in your studio, like a small group of people or an individual whose entire job it is to make sure that everybody who's added bad things to the engine, they're the ones who go and clean it up. And I run into that over and over again at studios. Uh, it, that person is generally very sad. So if you end up going, end up going this route, um, keep that person very happy. Uh, give them gifts, give them food, um, a place to sleep, ideally. But at, at Epic, what we try to do is keep the entire team responsible for performance. This isn't perfect for every team out there, but if you can pull it off, it will make the entire production a lot easier. Uh, so if you check something into the game at Epic, you are personally responsible for making sure that you didn't tank frame rate. So we have a QA pass that runs every single night. If whatever you added, be it uh, something in, the, in environment art or a character, if you have killed performance, you're going to get an email about it and you need to fix it. Uh, make sure that you have a testing process like that in hand. Have a, a QA pass that goes on. You can use automated testing for certain things. But either way, don't rely on a small group of people to keep up with what the rest of your art team is trying to destroy. I mean that with all love in my heart. So uh, also, OK, that, that kind of covered that. The, the key point being, make sure that you're aware of your performance before you check something in. So that goes along, though, with making sure you're aware of how to track that performance. Insofar as you can, it's important to make sure that as many of your artists and tech artists as possible are aware of the avenues for keeping track of performance in the engine. We have a lot of tools for this. We have a GPU profiler. We have a CPU profiler. We have different view modes to tell you how expensive things are, like shaders, or whether or not you're LODing properly. So make sure everybody knows about these and make sure that they use them on their content before they check it in. Know about things like the stat commands, which just call up what the engine is calculating. There's like a few of the more common ones there on the side of the screen. Know about the show flags. So every time I go to a studio and they're like, hey, my performance is really haywire. We know it's hammering like maybe CPU or GPU. The first thing I will do is just jump in with show flags and start turning things on and off. So it's like, oh, we're getting 10 frames a second. Turn off the foliage. We're getting 60 frames a second. You've got a problem with foliage. So again, the, the view modes know what all of these do. They're very easy to turn on and off. You can glean a lot of information from these very quickly. Uh, it actually wasn't that long ago. I was at a licensee. They were experiencing this one problem with a Vista scene uh, in their world. They would step out of this, this cavern or something and onto the, like, this beautiful Vista, and it was tanking their frame rate. And they were trying to figure out why they had stayed on top of all the things they were supposed to do with foliage. They'd been smart about their materials. Or so they thought. So we immediately went into uh, shader complexity mode, and the sky looked like a nuclear bomb was in the process of going off. It was bright white. And it turned out that the, the person who was making the sky in the background composited together several translucent domes in order to make all of their clouds. Because from an artist's perspective, that kind of makes sense. It's actually like, you know, I'm trying to make excuses for them, but it's like uh, like Photoshop layers, right? You can have one nice animated cloud and then another one composited behind it. And it's like, I see how we got here, but there needs to be a little more accountability. Make sure that you at least turn these views on every now and then. And if you see something more than just a little bit of red, you probably have a problem. Another common one that this will show off is overdraw. Uh, as folks throw a lot of foliage into their scenes, overdraw tends to kill you. Uh, make sure that you know about, like, when we, you just remember the, the kite demo we did a couple of years ago? That's where, you know, we had tons of trees and grass everywhere, and we quickly found out that we needed to actually cut around all of our grass planes so that the vertices actually match the shape of the grass, because if you don't, overdraw slowly kills you. And we have documentation on all of that, so make sure you've read it. Quick note on the GPU uh, and CPU profilers, at least know what they are. We have videos on how to use them. Most artists probably don't need to do this deep of a dive into their content, but if they're that motivated, that's awesome. Uh, if you have to do a deep dive, we generally still use RenderDoc at the office. Uh, the, GPU pro the GPU profiler we have is awesome, and it'll actually bring up a lot of the, uh, the, the more common stuff that is going to come up, things like, oh, you have a shadow casting light here, or you're using lit translucency way up there in the corner where you don't need it. But uh, RenderDoc does a, a really good job of going pass by pass and showing you what you're doing. So know how to use that. 
Okay, next point. And this is the one that I'm super passionate about because I spend a lot of time using this, is studios that use blueprints unwisely. That means a lot of things to a lot of people. I've heard some, like the moment I brought this topic up, actually, I think at the last dev day we had, I, I had an engineer come to me after the talk and he was like, so when you say you use Blueprint unwisely, you mean at all, right? And that's, that's not the case at all. Blueprint's actually pretty awesome. It's just some engineers don't like it. But it's uh, understanding how you should be using it. Blueprint is super powerful. The best thing about Blueprint is it gives artists the opportunity to program. And the worst thing about Blueprint is it gives artists the opportunity to program. It's designed as a programming language for people who don't necessarily know how computers work and don't know how to make the proper decisions to do what it is they need to do. But the good part about it is that despite that, they can still get something going. So in that way, it's at least a communication facilitator, and we'll kind of talk about that. Uh, so the, the other side, which most of you already know, Blueprint lives kind of on its own VM layer. It's always going to be slower than C++. Most of your artists, people who are just starting out, who haven't really used it before, they don't know that. So when I go into things like that, when I say that Blueprint is, all, is going to be slower than C++ all the time, it's kind of important to come back and say, don't be afraid to use it. Blueprint is actually a really good thing. We have tens of thousands of Blueprints in all of our games, but it's because of how we've implemented it. Uh, I do run into studios all the time, though, uh, that because they are, usually it's in a case where the, uh, the studios are very engineer heavy, they try to avoid blueprints altogether, and that leads to a lot of pain and suffering. Uh, it is the kind of final layer for any artistic side of whatever class you're defining, and it, at least keep that in mind. Also, it's much faster, as we, uh, as we discussed earlier, in terms of iteration. So Blueprint is going to be your best option when you're prototyping, uh, when you're building something up for the very first time. Uh, creating and iterating on relatively simple event-driven logic. So if something is uh, nicely event-driven, not really relying too much on tick, and isn't doing anything too heavy when those events fire, you can probably leave it in Blueprint forever, and it'll be just fine. You can probably ship that. Uh, when you want to expose native functionality, like a black box for artists to use, oh, hang on, there we go. So there's a there's an old demo I used to give uh, back in way back in the day when I was just kind of showing Blueprint off for people. I would make um, cows rain from the sky, like little toy cows, and it was neat, right? Because like, oh, people haven't seen how Blueprint works, so we'll make a 3D volume. We'll pick a random spot inside of it. That's where we'll spawn a toy cow. It'll fall, bounce around explode, rainbows will come out. It makes people happy. One of our engineers watched me do that demo so many times that he's like, okay, I'm sick of watching you actually create all the nodes for, for the math of solving a random point in a volume, so I've made you a node for that. So, and it actually, it's there. If you, uh, if you open up Blueprint and search for random point uh, within a box, that's, that's that node. So you can do that for your artists. If there is functionality that they have to be creating over and over again in Blueprint, consider just nativizing that, especially if it's math heavy, because you'll speed them up and you'll speed their result up as well. Uh, anyway, if you're just using a Blueprint for a container for editable variables and references from a derived base class, this is actually the ideal for Blueprint. So in Fortnite, we do have tens of thousands of, of Blueprints, and most of them are data only which means that we have a C++ class which does all the heavy lifting, and we've just laid out hooks for things like what mesh is it using, what material is it using, what, how much damage can it take before you can turn it into wood or whatever. And all of that is just a series of properties you adjust. That is extremely light. Don't be afraid of doing that. Uh, anytime you need a way to handle art asset references for a class, of course you don't want to hard code these, kind of what I was mentioning a second ago. And then when you need to free up a coder's time to work on the more important stuff, because when you're trying to figure out how you're going to write a new shader into our renderer, and somebody comes up and says, hey, I need to build the perfect elevator. Can you code me something that'll do this? Like that, that just eats up your time. Now, the next part of this, this is probably the most important part of Blueprint. Um, that we try to stress to folks. Make sure this is the slide I think it is. So programmers and blueprints. Uh, because I have to have this discussion with a lot of engineers, a lot of programmers don't like having to use uh, a, a graph system, and I totally understand that. There are things that are easier to do if you're just typing out some code. But programmers should know the basics of blueprint. Make sure you're at least familiar with how it works. 
uh, and how, how to make the most out of it so that you can be a guiding light for the people who do not. But when you know about it, it also gives you the opportunity to see how you could enable your artists. Like what nodes could you write for them to make their workflow a little faster? Uh, we know that some things are better off done in C++, so you can do that for people. Uh, we'll, I'll go into a little more detail on that in just a moment. But again, also, uh, as I mentioned a second ago, final classes extending from Blueprint is generally the way to go. Do all of your heavy lifting over in code, and then let the artist just extend that in Blueprint. OK, so back to kind of the, the key of this whole point. Non-programmers are going to make bad decisions. We all know this. Anybody who's used Blueprint uh, early on in a UE4 title, you've seen this happen. The way you solve this problem is by mentorship. And this is something that we stress to, uh, to everyone we can. It's a big deal at Epic. Make sure that you have somebody on your engineering team or some bodies who can sit down with your artists, sit down with your designers, go over the Blueprints they're making, and point out where they're starting to go astray. Show them where they're making the bad decisions. Actually, at Epic, this has been a long-standing thing. Like, even back in the Gears of War days when folks were building stuff out in Kismet, every few weeks, an engineer would sit down and go over the Kismet graphs of the, of the artists and find the flaws, maybe nativize a few things for them. But there was this process of code review from people who know more about how computers work. Take the time and do that. It pays off later on down the road. It can be a little painful at first, sure, but don't leave people in the dark. There's a horror story attached to this, actually. So there is a studio that I went to. Um, they were they hit us up because they were in uh, some serious, desperate trouble. And I go there, and what had happened was somebody had heard that Blueprint was this perfect way to enable artists and, and designer people to write code. So they more or less just lobbed it over the wall into this room of about eight or nine purely art-centric people. And I go in there and they're showing me, they give me this like show and tell. They sit me down like, here's this thing that I built. And I saw the worst things I've ever seen in my life. It was horrifying. This one guy in particular, and honestly, high fives for because he got something to work, but what he was trying to do was build up a, a weapon system, very much like you would do with like a class hierarchy, right? Where you have, you know, like your weapon class and maybe rifles and pistols or what have you. Instead of doing that, though, because he knew nothing about class hierarchies or how they should work, his construction script was a series of Boolean checkboxes. So he had this massive construction script that if you zoomed out far enough would probably fit on that wall. And every time you checked a checkbox on his details panel, it would add or remove components to make what he thought he wanted. So you could check, like, is a rifle, and it would add like this whole component full of functionality and add the mesh he needed. Technically, it was actually kind of neat that he got it working at all. The great part, though, was not that he said, hey, how should I be doing this because this isn't right or whatever. He said, I feel like there's a problem in Blueprint because when I bring this into the level, it takes 15 seconds to appear. So that's what I'm talking about with mentorship. Sit down with your folks. Make sure they understand some best practices. Point out when they're making bad decisions and help guide them along the way. Because over time, what ends up happening is those, those visual people, those artists, those designers, they start thinking more like programmers. We've seen it at Epic. We've seen it at many studios who follow this pattern. Eventually, those artists will come to you in the lunchroom and they'll say, like, hey, there's this thing I want to build, and here's kind of how I think I want to do it. And instead of being like aghast, you'll, you'll, you'll be like, OK, yeah, that makes sense. Maybe you want to try this or that. But you start smoothing out that process. So teach your people. Some common blueprint problems that people run into over and over again. Too many hard references to other assets. Be very careful about casting to specific classes. This is an easy one that a lot of people overlook. Once artists learn that they can cast out to things and grab all the functionality to it, they'll do it a lot. Um, one, one game in particular, uh, not terribly long ago, their main character cast out to everything he could ever interact with in the game. So when the game would actually start, it basically loaded half of the entire game because he was referencing everything. And then all the things those were referencing and so forth. So you get this spider web effect where you're loading everything all at once. Know about soft references. Use instances for blueprint communication. Uh, make it easy on yourself in that regard. Another common one is too many components. 
So on our game classes, I think we probably try to keep component counts to 15 to 20, but that's really content dependent. That could mean a lot of things to a lot of people. And try not to use uh, scene components. So scene components have to have their uh, locations updated with the main actor. So that's, that's just more calculation. But having too many components in general makes something harder to spawn, makes garbage collection take longer. So by all means, use components. Just be smart about it. And another one is too much functionality. As we've been discussing, Blueprint is a scripting layer. You, it's, it's a scripting language in and of itself. And just like with code, you don't want to put too much functionality in one class. There is a, a studio that wrote their own editor plugin uh, inside the editor where if you added the 101st node into a Blueprint graph, a modal window pops up that says, get a programmer right now. I'm not sure if that's a good idea, but I can see where it would be useful. So don't force a ton of functionality through the limited, func uh, the limited window of the, C of the uh, Blueprint bottleneck. You know, another one. This is going to come up a couple of times uh, throughout the day, I think. Uh, so a word on using tick. I try to tell artists and people who are not skilled scripters never to use tick. Just don't look at it, don't touch it, pretend it's not there. If you think you need it, if you're sure you need it, still don't use it. However, um, there's some things to know about that. So first off, all blueprints by default tick. Many of you know this already. Uh, we run into a lot of studios who don't. The Unreal Engine tends to skew toward functional more than highly performant, at least in, in a lot of our default settings. So because of that, when you create a brand new blueprint, it is ticking by default. That's why you can connect something to the tick events and have it actually work. We made that decision because we have people who are going to be new to the engine or new to games in general, and we want them to be able to hook something up and have it, have it function. But if you don't know that and you're making a AAA title and you have hundreds or thousands of blueprints in your scene and you didn't change that, they're all ticking by default. So go in and turn that off. It's a pretty easy code change to the base class so that that uh, isn't the default setting, but know that that's a thing. A lot of studios don't. If you have used tick, uh, instruct your people on how to be smart about it. Turn it on when you need it. Let it finish whatever it's doing. And as soon as it's done ticking, disable tick. Leave it off if you can. And make sure people know that they can adjust the tick frequency. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of artists don't know that they can do this. You can make something tick five times a second if you want to. Some things are light enough that ticking isn't a major concern. So, you know, I, I don't stress that point to newcomers that often. I'd rather have them avoid it until they absolutely know they need it because it's, it's like the dark side of the force. It's the quick and easy path, and it will kill you at death at a thousand cuts. But uh, you, you can use it for, for light things if you need to. Now, the ideal blueprint setup, what we wish everybody would do with blueprint is think of it as a, the final extension of an existing C++ class. You'll prototype whatever it is you want to build, and then provided you need the performance back, uh, by all means, don't over-optimize. But if you know you need that, uh, that perf back, you will take your Blueprint class, you'll nativize it, you'll lay down the hooks you need, and essentially create a data-only Blueprint that your artist can just change the properties of. Now, it may be a lot of work for some projects. It's not going to be something that you can do all the time. But when you can, the performance gains are often worth it. OK, next major pitfall, forgetting target platforms. This is one of those things that uh, every time I say it out loud, I feel, I feel kind of bad because it's like, of course, you, you, you're not going to do that. It sounds obvious when you say it. But actually, very recently, as recent as like a month ago, a studio hit us up and they were like, hey, we just cannot hit our frame rate. In fact, they were way off base on their frame rate on a given platform, and it turned out they had made it all the way through production, and then they tried to test it on a target platform. It does happen. So it's very common for projects to grow to more platforms. Uh, ask us how we know. If you think there's a possibility you might ship on a platform, then you are shipping on that platform, and, be, and plan for that. Know that plans change. Uh, the platform that you ignored last year may be the thing that you absolutely must ship on this year. Always, val uh, always know the value of the lowest common denominator. Again, this is one that generally should go without saying, but make sure you're doing the bulk of your testing on your weakest platform where it makes sense. Uh, so on consoles, that's going to be Xbox One. Switch is kind of its own thing. It's, it has more in common with a, 
with a tablet or maybe a mobile device. Everyone who can be testing should be testing, but don't overdo it. Like all of your artists don't necessarily need a dev kit at their desk. At the very least, make sure you have a QA pass that is running very frequently to catch problems as they pop up and don't put it off. Get the dev kits and use them. Uh, this is basically saying the same thing. So lots of late development pain can be solved by getting your project on your lowest common denominator and do this early. You can't do it soon enough. Uh, even your vertical slices, test them on what you think they can ship on. If you've got the bandwidth, the ability to do it, uh, take the time and do it. And yeah, there's, there's kind of my horror story earlier. Don't be that studio that tries to cram the game that you have been developing on a 1080 Ti Xeon system for the last six months onto an Xbox One and then hit us up crying desperately because it won't run fast. So uh, another one, and this is, um, this is one that gets overlooked still pretty often. Do not think you have to and do not fall into the trap of building per platform content. The engine is very smart about allowing for content quality switches. So uh, you can quality switch inside of materials. We do this often. We never would have got Paragon working on PS4 at the speed it did without this feature. Essentially, like on Paragon, we only ever use the high quality shaders if you were playing on PC. Uh, if you were on PS4, it dropped to medium uh, immediately. So make sure you're using all of the features that we've given you access to. Know about device profiles. Uh, even blueprints can know what platform they're on. So you can have entirely different behavior inside of a blueprint based on, or in code as well, based on what platform you're on. This is a really quick one. It's just something I, I felt bad if I didn't throw it in here. Uh, improper granularity for your games. So loading content via level streaming obviously can get expensive, and it's super common for folks to load in too much at once and thereby run into hitches. Uh, you can do async loading, but there's no magic solution here. So this is one of the, f the few uh, pitfalls where I can't just say, oh, just do this thing and it'll all, it'll all be better. At the end of the day, you will have to do less. Know that this is something that comes up in a lot of projects uh, because projects tend to grow, because scope tends to change, things can get a little bit fluid. You end up in a situation where what was streaming in fine a month into the project is now causing hitches three months in. Know it's a common problem. Be ready to downscale your granularity. All right, closing in toward the end. So uh, pitfall six, fighting the tech. Now, this can mean a lot of things, but at a high level, the Unreal Engine does a lot of things uh, really well, but it's, it's a generic system. It's not really geared specifically toward any one type of game and odds are pretty good that you may need to, to uh, have the engine do something that we didn't necessarily design it for, and so it may be time to customize the engine. But if you do that, you should know a few things before you make changes. Many parts of the engine are deeply interconnected to other parts, so uh, a change here can lead to a lot of work and a lot of hassle later on down the road. A common example of this is like the, uh, the character movement component. Uh, on every single character in the engine. So every once in a while, talking to a licensee, they'll say, hey, character movement component's great, but it's costing us a little too much for, what it, for the type of game we're trying to make, so we're gonna roll our own. And that's fine, but know that like, if you open up that class, that's also handling all of the replication for that character. It's handling a lot of different moving, uh, moving parts, such as whether it jumps off of a nav mesh and so forth. We've written a lot of functionality to try to make your life easier, and as soon as you start changing things, you're now responsible for making sure the rest of it comes along as well. Also know that if you make changes to the engine itself, obviously integrations become harder, getting updates from us can be more difficult. Uh, that's prob that probably goes without saying for most of the engineers in the room, but uh, it is something that we do run into and can slow down your overall iteration time. We'd like to keep you on the most uh, recent version of the engine for as long as you can. The way to work around that is try to keep all of your engine changes in plugins as much as you can. That's not always possible. If you're changing the renderer, for example, it's very hard to make a plugin for that. Uh, know that we almost never take on code changes. We get asked a lot, like, hey, we made this change. It made it easier for us to make our game. Can you guys take it on so we don't have to maintain it? Odds are we won't unless it's something that we need uh, because if we're not using it, it'll probably rot. Uh, also know that we may at some point totally rewrite a system because the Unreal Engine is in a constant state of development. A really good example of this is the upcoming rewrite of the renderer. 
If you've already made a lot of changes uh, for your game uh, inside the rendering system, then 422 is probably going to be a very difficult integration for you. We try to keep our developers abreast of these upcoming changes, and we work very hard not to break your content, but just know that that's a thing. So how do you know when you can or when it's safe or how you should make changes? Stay in contact. If you're about to change something, jump on UDN. Let us know what you're thinking. Let us know what you're about to do and your thoughts on how you think you're going to do it. Our engineers will respond to you and say, uh, maybe you shouldn't do that, or maybe you should move over here, or maybe you should try this other technique. But let us talk to you. Don't just do it in the dark, because that can lead to problems down the road. And this is, I threw this in because engineers specifically asked me to. If you ask on UDN about changing a system and our engineers say, I wouldn't do that if I were you, please strongly consider their words. OK, last part is ignoring the epic support structure. And this is not, not something like you, people don't often ignore it, but we run into case after case after case where studios aren't using it to its full potential or aren't using it correctly. So know the difference between UDN and Answer Hub. So uh, just to make sure I've said it out loud, UDN is our internal system where when you guys as developers have questions, you ask us a question, it goes straight to us. We answer it. We, try to, we strive to get you an answer within 24 hours. We don't always hit that, but we do our best. And if we have to escalate something, it tends to go all the way to the developer who actually wrote the system you're asking about. If you are on Answer Hub, you are talking to Joe the Fortnite streamer. You could be talking to anybody, and we don't vet that content. You could be getting really bad, uh, bad advice. Several times I've been to studios, and I try to tell people, hey, you should ask this question on UDN. And I've had folks actually blow up at me before. They're like, we did. We asked like seven questions on UDN, and nobody ever came back to us. And only then do we find out they've been asking all their questions over on the Answer Hub. So we know that those two websites look a lot alike. Please make sure you're, you're asking in the right area. So who should be accessing UDN? This is another one that do, isn't perfectly uniform. Anybody who is touching the engine should have a UDN account. And any time any of those people have a question, they should feel perfectly enabled to just jump in and ask. Um, I know there's sometimes cultural concerns. People don't want to look dumb or, or whatever. Please, it's totally fine. We actually have an entire tier of people who just handle the easy stuff. So ask us anything you need. We will get you taken care of. And of course, when should you ask questions? Really, whenever you have them. So what happens when you need something more than UDN? So when you're a custom licensee, we get it. Uh, UDN is great for what it does. But sometimes you have a question that is very broad or would benefit from a discussion. Start it on UDN anyway. Ask your question, please. Even if you've got to get really verbose, write us a, a, a paragraph or a page or something to let us know what you're struggling with. And then reach out and send uh, your sales rep, like Joe Kreiner or David Stelzer, send them a link to your UDN question. And if we need to escalate it from there, it's actually pending availability. It's fairly easy for us to get developers onto something like a conference call and talk you through what you're trying to do. Don't be afraid to reach out in that way. We want to help you ship. We want to help you be successful. When should you do this? Not all the time, obviously. It's, uh, very, it may not be uh, possible for us to get people into the room that you need. So when you're in those time-sensitive situations, when you're closing in on ship, you're closing in on a vertical slice, you have a major milestone ahead of you, and something is, uh, is locking you up and you're blocked, please reach out. And then we'll find a way to escalate the problem and get you taken care of. And again, do that through your sales rep. So many of the worst cases we've seen of this, uh, we've seen from developers stem from not letting us help when they need it. This is really every, every major problem I've talked about during this talk, where people are uh, having a hard time getting something running on platform, or they're using too many objects, it really just boils down to them not reaching out when they needed the help and thinking they could do it themselves, which is fine. Just remember, you're not an island. Please stay in contact with us. Uh, even if you think you can solve the problem, go ahead and ask on UDN first, and then by all means keep searching, but let us, t let us try to help you out. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of Dev Day, and I think it's lunchtime, so thank you.